you may remember a movie uh, from the black and white days called Sergeant York. Sergeant York is a movie about a World War, I believe it was World War I uh, soldier named Alvin York, and Alvin York was uh, a reprobate and a drinker and a brawler, and he was converted to Christ uh, in, the, in the movie, and, I'm, and I'm, I believe in real life as well. And he had a problem going to war. So he eventually got by his uh, objections, by his issues, and he went to war and he was a great hero in the war. Well, there's a scene in that movie. I used to watch this with my dad. There's a scene in that movie where Sergeant York is going through the woods in the rain. It's a rainstorm and a lightning storm. And he is, he's got his gun and he's going, I believe he's going to kill someone. He's on a, he's on a, a vengeance tour and he's going to dish it out to someone. And while he's on his horse, he gets struck by lightning. His barrel of his, the barrel of his rifle is bent, if I recall. I haven't seen the movie in a long time. And he hears the, the sound of uh, congregational singing in his ear, and he goes into the church, and he gets saved. And this idea that people get saved in a lightning bolt. Tonight's discussion is uh, evangelism and revival. Evangelism and outreach and revival. We're going to continue this series talking about growing a church, reviving a Baptist church. And uh, this idea that people are converted in a flash is probably one of the most destructive ideas that has ever entered into the church because it has caused us to focus only on that moment where we're trying to create this Alvin York type response to the gospel. So tonight as we enter in and we begin to talk about uh, evangelism, outreach, and revival, I want to, us to deal with this. We will deal with this question. It, do people get saved like Alvin York? And if not, how do they get saved? And what is what does that mean for our approach to outreach and evangelism as we try to grow our churches again. So tonight in our session we want to do four things. First of all we're going to hit this idea of the whole salvation process. We're going to talk about how a person comes to faith. Is it like Alvin York or not? And then we want to look at a couple of, uh, of areas to apply these truths about evangelism and outreach we want to look at individual efforts. We want to ask what can we do as individuals to uh, evangelize and reach out and help the churches grow. And then we want to look at group efforts. How should churches think corporately about doing things that bring about the conversion of souls and the increase in the size of the kingdom of God. And then finally we want to talk about preaching efforts. How should we be thinking as preachers and teachers of the word about this whole issue of of drawing the lost with the word, seeing them converted by the things that we teach, uh, the things that we include in our teaching, what we say and what we cover and that kind of thing. So that's what we want to do this evening. So first of all, let's talk about this salvation process. As I said, most people think, and, I, and certainly true of most Baptists, we talk about getting people saved. And the way we think about it is we need to get somebody in the building. They need to hear this message. And like York, bam, they will, just, they will just be converted instantly. So most of our efforts have focused on getting people to that point where that lightning bolt can strike. But my, my question to you is, is that true? Is it true that people, as a rule, are converted to Christ like a lightning bolt, or is there more to it than that? Is there more going on? Is there more to this process than just this one-time shot? I think that there is. And if you've done uh, any evangelism in your life individually and you've talked to people about the Lord, what you realize is some people indeed are ready for harvest. They are sort of like this picture here of this cornfield. Really all you have to do is tell them the gospel and they believe. And that's sort of the Alvin York uh, scenario. Uh, but other people that you talk to, 
you can tell that they just are not ready to be harvested. They're, they are moving towards the gospel and believing the gospel, but they have things that they need to work out. They're more like this field here, which is plowed and ready to, be, to have seed sown and eventually to bring forth a harvest, but not ready for the harvest yet. And then there are yet other people, and I am inclined to believe, and I'll tell you why here in just a, a few minutes, that most people are like this wooded scene here. Their souls are full of debris, uh, full of rotten logs, grown over with bush and briar, and before you're going to be able to get this kind of person to the point of believing the gospel, you've got a lot of work to do. And if you've ever talked to someone who was constantly throwing back uh, objections in your face, constantly disagreeing with you, you, you realize even if you thought that they should come to Christ in a in a lightning bolt. If you reflect on that, you will see that there was no way that person was going to come like Alvin York. That person was going to take a much longer time. And that is really what the scriptures teach us. Let me show you some fascinating verses that, again, uh, one of the things I pointed out before is that we filter truth. We see what we want to see and we miss the things that we don't uh, that we haven't heard before. So this is another example of truth filtering. But let's look at what Jesus said in John chapter 4. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Now let's look at the words of the Messiah. He is talking to his disciples and he is telling them, I'm about to send you in to a field, and that field is ready for harvest. But what he wanted them to be sure to understand was that that harvest that they were getting ready to take in was not just due to their showing up and telling people about him. It was the result of the hard work of other people through time. And so this idea that we just reap is not at all in accordance with what Jesus says here. And in other versions, it will say, I'm sending you to reap what you, have, uh, what you have not labored. Others have done the hard work, and you have entered into their labors. And so Jesus is describing here a process that began before these disciples went in to, to, to gather this harvest in, the book of, harvest in the book of Acts. There was something going on in the lives of these people. There were other laborers that were coming in and working on uh, these people and their faith before they got to the point where they were going to be harvested. We see this in another context in Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He is, he is really rebuking the Corinthians for taking sides between him and Apollos. And he says this, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And so we see here that Paul is telling the Corinthians that they don't need to start following Apollos now. They don't even need to start following Paul. They need to see that both Paul and Apollos played their part in the development of this crop. And it was, but it was God all along who granted the increase. And Pastor James was talking this morning about the Holy Spirit, and that is God the Holy Spirit doing doing the work in the background to make all of this happen. So you see here that Paul planted, Apollos watered. You see that? But God caused it to grow. So we, we, are, we need to recognize that people don't come to faith in Christ in a lightning bolt. They come through a process. And if you pay attention, if you look in your own life, if you talk to people who have been saved, most of them will tell you that yes, there was a point where they believed. My experience, I had a very much a Paul-like experience in my conversion. I was, uh, to other people's view, I was completely lost and hell-bent. But, and then all of a sudden I wasn't. And Dana's family and my family, they had a hard time. And they, still have, they still have a hard time with what happened to me. But as I reflect on it, I know that for years before my conversion, the Holy Spirit was working on me, 
waking me up to things, causing me to question things. And so when I came to faith, yes, it was, it was from the observer's perspective, Alvin York, but from what I knew to be true, it wasn't that at all. It was a process. So we have to understand that because it affects the way that we will do our work in evangelism. And that's one of the reasons that our evangelism has been so uh, ineffective is that we focused only in one place. And let me show you that. So what I have found in my experience, and I put this in a couple of different books to kind of lay it out, but I found that that, that person who is uh, has that overgrown field, I call those folks gospel hardened. I found three types of people that, that you will evangelize and that you will talk to. Gospel hardened, at gospel open, and gospel ready. Gospel hardened, gospel open, and gospel ready. And the gospel hardened person is skeptical. They're skeptical. They don't believe much of what you say. They're even antagonistic towards the Bible. They're angry at God. They're angry at Christians. Their mind is made up. These people are atheists, agnostics, idolaters, pagans. These, these are your, your, your hardened, uh, aggressive unbelievers. They are gospel hardened. And then you have the gospel open. The gospel open are not, uh, they've had more of their questions answered. They're willing to talk to you. They're willing to listen to what you have to say. They're, they're, really, they're really investigating things. They have a lot of questions. Their hearts seem to be thawing, but they're not ready for a decision. And if you try and press them, you'll find that you won't get a decision. And then there's gospel ready. These people have come through this process, whether it be over the course of years or months or weeks, and they understand the basics of the gospel. They understand the basics of faith as it's described in the New Testament. They have most of their questions satisfied, and they're ready to enter the kingdom. Now, I have, I have been with all of these, and I have found that the great majority are on the far left, gospel-hardened. Gospel, gospel open, are, there are fewer of those, but there are some, and there are very few gospel-ready. And we'll, I'm going to show you why as we look at the work that we have to do. So with a gospel-hardened person, you cannot try to reap them. You have to work with them to cultivate. You have to help pull out those branches and those briars. And I'm going to tell you how to do that in brief here in a moment. You have to start to move out those roots and dig up those rocks. And then there's the gospel open. When you have those folks, you have to work on sowing. You have to, you're sowing information. You're sowing truth. You're, you're really trying to plant some seeds so that they could grow into faith. And then with the gospel ready, you are ready to reap. Now let's look at the kinds of things that cultivating, sowing, and reaping include in this gospel-hardened, gospel-open, and gospel-ready uh, three-part approach to lost people. Cultivating, cultivating is, uh, starts off with your personal witness. Most people who are gospel-hardened have seen a lot of hypocrites, and so being a good, godly Christian in front of these people without even saying a word is incredibly important. You will never get a gospel-hardened person to move along in his process of believing if you don't have a good testimony. And then you have relationships. Relationships become key. Be, befriending lost people, being kind to them, letting them see that you know, you guys aren't too bad. You noticed when we did Operation Wishbone, one of the reasons that I wanted us to have them come into the building and force them to interact with us is so they would see that we're nice people, that we're not out to hurt them, that we're not mean, we're not all hypocrites, because I know that most of them are gospel hardened, and so we have to begin to work on that, and then we do that via uh, relationships. Apologetics, answering faith questions, we'll talk more about that here in a moment. But when you get to someone who is gospel um, open, you can be more aggressive in your question answering. You can be more aggressive in your apologetics. You can uh, directly address the basics of the faith and of the gospel. And you can share the gospel with them to help them begin to understand it. You know, there is a lot of things, there are a lot of things that we have to understand to believe. We talk about it as being simple, and of course, in a sense it is. But think about it. You have to understand what sin is. You have to understand who God is. You have to understand what repentance is, who Jesus is, what Jesus did, what believing means, you see what I mean? There's a lot to sort of 
wrestle with in your mind and understand. And then reaping. Reaping is when you're, you're, you're past all that. You're sharing the gospel in detail with clarity and passion, and you're asking the people to believe. And the reason that, that we are not seeing a lot of reaping is because we haven't done the first two very well. In fact, I would suggest we've almost done none of the first two in the church in America. We, we, we go right to reaping, but you can't reap something that you haven't planted, and you can't plant something in a field that's overgrown with bushes and briars and leaves and full of rocks. You see, Jesus said, you're, re you're entering in to receive this harvest, but you haven't done any hard work. The other people have done the hard work. And so we must do the hard work of cultivating and sowing if we are going to reap uh, anything of substantial in terms of souls. So we have to change the way we look at doing evangelism by understanding the place that, understanding where people are in a process, not in a lightning bolt. Now I want to hit here this word apologetics. I want to talk about this word apologetics. It is incredibly important as we try to do the hard work to lead people to faith in Jesus. So let's talk about uh, apologetics a little bit more. Let me help you to understand this a little bit better. Apologetics is from a Greek word and it simply means to defend your faith. If you if you were to be able to get inside the average lost person's mind, I have a, a graphic here to show you. What you're going to find is you're going to find that he is considering two different paths. He's looking to the left and he sees this broad path and he sees all of his sin and all of his, his pornography and all of his partying and all, all of his lostness and his drugs and alcohol and money and greed. And over on to the right, he's also faced, in the United States at least, with this thing called the cross, with Jesus Christ. But what has happened over the last hundred years of American history is that, they, is that the entire culture has formed a mental brick wall in front of the cross that has intellectual questions uh, attached to it. So we have been told so often that evolution is true and the Bible is not. We've been told so often there are billboards that people put up questioning the existence of God, questioning the miracles. We have books called the Da Vinci Code that challenge the underlying uh, uh, documents of the New Testament, whether or not it was uh, valid, the copies, can they be copied. We have other Gospels that are uh, uh, pointed out in the culture and promoted among people. We have world religions. There are so many of these that have been laid brick by brick in the lives and minds of people that they look over to the cross and they simply dismiss it as intellectual nonsense, that it just is a bunch of fairy tales. They also look here at other things, like they're going to see, when they look over there, they'll see not only uh, different uh, sins, but they'll also see different religions. One of the reasons that we're seeing so many Christians, former Christians, children of Christians, grandchildren of Christians, move into these false religions, New Age, Buddhism, worship of science and evolution, uh, spiritism, demonic stuff. One of the reasons that we're seeing that is because we have not worked on that wall as a church. We have, this is why I said early on, that that Sergeant York syndrome has killed our efforts to reap because we are not willing, we think we just need to share the gospel, we just need to share the gospel. I heard someone tell me once, the average person has to hear the gospel seven times before they believe. As if all you ever have to do is just go and tell somebody the ABCs of the gospel. ABC, 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 accept, believe, confess, accept, believe, confess, accept, believe, confess. And if you do it seven times, they'll magically believe. And that's utter nonsense. And it's prevented us from answering these questions in the church on an ongoing, consistent basis. And that is why that, when you go and talk to someone about the gospel, that's why they don't believe. They might not tell you in so many words. If you ask the right questions, they'll tell you. And that's why they end up in these other faith systems, because they find answers there. And that's really our fault. We have failed in this, and it goes back to this faulty view of how someone is converted. 
Let me ask you a question. Why would you accept the Jesus of the Bible if you have rejected the Bible of Jesus? Think about that for a moment. Where do we find the, the Jesus? Where do we find Jesus? How do we know about Jesus? How do we know about the cross? How do we know about Mary? How do we know about uh, the, the, uh, the Magi and all of that stuff? How do we know about the Christmas star and all of that? We know about it because of the Bible. How do we know that he was crucified and resurrected? We know it because of the Bible. All right, but if you don't believe the Bible, if you've rejected the Bible because you've heard for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years that it's not true, and when you went to church on your uncle's birthday or when you went to church for Christmas, you never heard a single answer to any of those questions. Why on earth would you believe in the Jesus that that Bible tells you about? You won't. And that's why we don't see people converted. We have not done the hard work. And part of that hard work is answering those questions. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about how you, we might be able to do that down a little bit later here. But apologetics is critical. This is why we do the conferences that we do, the Answers Conferences. And this is also why when we had Operation Wishbone, those of you who were there, when I gave the message to the people, you probably noticed that I integrated answers to questions that people have in the presentation of the Gospel. I talked about Noah's Ark, I talked about the global flood, I talked about the uh, seashells, fossilized seashells being found at the top of Mount Everest in the Himalayas. Why did I do that? Because I know that people are gospel hardened. I know they need answers to questions and we've got to start giving them answers. You might have thought, well that was really weird, Wes. That felt weird. Well, it felt weird because nobody's doing it. Not because it's wrong. It felt weird because we've been doing it wrong for a hundred years. And we're paying the price for that. We have to integrate apologetics into our ministries. Now, I'm going to go through individual efforts now and also uh, efforts for, for, the, for the congregation. And I'll do these rather quickly. The individual efforts, I want to just give you some ideas of what you can do to evangelize. Another error that we make in evangelism is to think that the only thing you can do to do evangelism is to take a bunch of tracts and go down to the street corner and start preaching. Now that is absolutely and 100% a good way to do it. And we have people, men and women in the churches, who are gifted and called to do that. But everybody is not called to do that. Everybody's not gifted to do that. That is not the only thing you can do to participate in evangelism and outreach. So let me give you a few things that you can do here. There are seven, but we won't take long to talk about these. The first thing you all, we all can do is pray for lost people. Pray for lost people. Praying is not doing nothing. You, need, you, you may not be able to present the gospel to someone. You may trip over your words and be nervous and you think, I just can't do that. But brother or sister, you can pray. And you need to pray for your children, your grandchildren that are lost, your friends, your co-workers. We need to pray for lost people in media, lost people in entertainment, lost people in politics. Pray because only the Holy Spirit can... We can go through that uh, gospel hardened, gospel open, gospel ready sort of scenario. We can do all the things that we're supposed to do and we need to. But if the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything, it won't matter. So we need to ask Him, plead with Him, plead with Jesus, plead with the Father to save people. So prayer, life witness. This is what we're talking about with the gospel hardened. Live a holy life. Tell the truth at work. Don't gossip. Don't be a hypocrite. Repent when you do something wrong. Show forth your life as a witness. Invite people to church. Invite people to church. I'm going to be talking more about preaching here at the end and why we need to uh, extend and expand our teaching to address the issues that the lost uh, need addressed. But you can invite people to church. You can hand out tracts. People will leave tracts. They'll get tracts, booklets, and they'll leave them in the bathrooms. They'll leave them... In, uh, with the, with the, on the table after they have a meal at a restaurant. You know, you can just hand them out. You don't have to say a word. Just thought I'd share this with you. You buy your biscuit at Hardee's, hand a lady a track and go, I just thought you might like this. Apologetics, answering questions. That's, we've already sort of talked about that, but you can do that. You can just simply try to answer one question for someone. 
When I'm talking to people, and I know I don't have much time, and I get into a spiritual conversation, I'll say, give me one question about the Bible. One question that you have about the Bible. Any. And then I'll try and answer it if I can. If I can, I'll go back and get the answer and come back and give it to them. You can do that. Testimony. Testimony is when you tell people your experience. What I just told you about my experience, the Paul-like experience that I had, you could tell people what Christ has done in your life, how he, has, how he reached you, how you changed, how he changed you, what, the, what, what happened. They cannot argue with your experience. It is yours, and you are the authority on your own experience. And then finally, you can share that gospel. You can tell them. You can give them the Roman roads. You can tell them the ABCs. You know, you can, you can do that, and there are many of you that are gifted to do that and feel called to do that, to, so continue to do that. But these are some options, and every single person listening to me can do, one, can do prayer, you can do life witness, you can invite people, and you can do testimony. You can do all those. So you can do a lot of these. You just have to put forth the effort and do it. So let's quickly talk about group efforts. Group efforts. There are really just two of these, and you know these already. We can do events. You know, the body of Christ is a whole body, so we're supposed to be working together to accomplish the mission of Jesus, not just individually trying to build His kingdom, but as a group build His kingdom. So what we can do is include evangelism-type events in our uh, yearly calendar. And remember, we want to include those events that, are, that include things for the gospel hardened, the gospel open, and the gospel ready. You don't just want to do one or the other. You want to kind of layer in and make sure you're covering all of these things for everyone. Vacation Bible School is a great example of an outreach event. Vacation Bible School is evangelism. And one of the great things I appreciate so much about uh, Samantha Telkin, who, uh, who handles and coordinates the VBS for us, is how open she has been to doing an apologetics-driven Vacation Bible School. We, uh, she plans, we plan to do it this year, to do uh, Answers in Genesis Creation VBS. We purchased the material, so we'll end up doing that next year. But how important that is, and I'm so thankful that she sees the need for that, because the children are being, the, the wall is being built in our children every day they go to public school. And so we have to, in the VBS, we have to start to tear down that boundary, that, that barrier, and give them reasons to believe, and then tell them the gospel. You see that? Operation Wishbone, we already talked about how we did that. Our answers conferences are specifically focused on that. And in the answers conferences, the one that we did, uh, I guess it's been over a year ago now, it was all about giving answers. But I hope you notice as, as I worked through those four presentations, I included the entire gospel in the whole thing. I layered it in so that as I was tearing down the wall for the gospel hardened and the gospel open, I was also trying to get the gospel ready, bring them to faith in Christ. You see, so you want to, that's why it's so important that preachers spend so much time, we're going to talk about that in a moment, working on this kind of thing. And then Sunday morning, we really have to think about uh, evangelism and lost people on Sunday morning. And I'll have more to say about this in future sessions, but we have, to, we have to begin to see our entire service process on Sunday morning through the eyes of a lost person. When they walk in the building, what does it look like to them? Does it look old and dingy? Does it look clean and organized? How do they view our processes? Do we, are we well uh, organized in terms of our nursery? Are we well organized in terms of our youth programs? What, what does the service look like? Is it disjointed? Do people not know what they're doing? Are people getting, uh, coming in late uh, to the nursery, coming in late to read the scripture? Does the sound booth have all the music? You see, we have to think about how we look to lost people. Now, not because we're trying to impress them, but because we're trying to present a positive image of Jesus Christ, that, that he is, Jesus has got it all together, and we want to present an image of his people who have it all together. These people are professional. These people are conscientious. These people are organized. So we have to work on that experience of our guests. Again, not to take it too far, but to make it so that there really isn't any reason for them not to come back. So professional activities, programs, and facilities in our culture, that's very important. So those are some of the things that we can do as a group. 
Now let me take a few moments and let me talk about preaching where evangelism and outreach is concerned. What most people think of when they think of preaching uh, for conversion and preaching for evangelistic preaching, they think of Sergeant York. They think of taking that gospel message and using it in such a way that it causes people, like a lightning flash, to believe. Now, it is very important that we continue to share and repeat the gospel. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. We should. It's good and right that we do that. But what I want to do now is I want to try and expand. If you're a preacher or a teacher, Bible study, anyone watching or will watch this in the future, I want to expand your mind based on what we've already talked about to some missed opportunities in our preaching to impact the gospel hardened, the gospel open, in addition to the gospel ready. When you walk into Sunday morning services, as I have viewed Sunday morning preaching for more than 20 years, what, what I find is the typical content of the preaching is what I call inner circle preaching. Inner circle preaching. Inner circle teaching and preaching is teaching that addresses the professed believer, one who is initiated into the Christian world. This includes spiritual topics that connect with and make sense to the person acquainted with the Bible and the basics of Christianity. This teaching is good, important, and necessary for the believer to grow. As believers, we need it to change us into the image of Christ. So this inner circle teaching is very good and very important, and we need it. So don't take this as a criticism of that, all right? I'm talking about missed opportunities here, not about mistakes or sins or anything like that. The problem with inner circle teaching is that it is a foreign language to someone outside of the kingdom. The terms and ideas are not understood, and they are irrelevant from the perspective of the lost person. So when we have a, uh, a sermon series, just pick something, we have one on uh, tithing, we have one on prayer, we have one on discipleship, great topics, and topics that need to be addressed on Sunday morning and the people need to thoroughly understand, okay? Just make sure you get that, I'm not criticizing it. But think about it if you walked into the the room and sat down as an atheist and you heard a series on tithing or you heard a series on prayer from the biblical perspective using Bible terms, Bible ideas, how well would you understand what was being said? How much would that connect with you? Now it's possible that it would. I'm not saying that it wouldn't completely and absolutely. But I believe we can do more to connect to lost people. And we do not have to fall into the ditch of the seeker-sensitive movement. Some of you, right away, when I start to, ex to expand on this, you're going to think seeker-sensitive. Forget that. I am 100% against that. But you can't go into the other ditch and say that you're not going to address anything lost people are interested in in a way that lost people can understand or, or relate to. That's the other ditch, you see? So you can't stay in one ditch because you're afraid to go in the other. I've talked to you about that before. To make Sunday morning preaching more impactful for those outside of the church, preachers and teachers must expand their teaching content to address those outside of the inner circle. This can be done by including teaching in at least two additional areas. So we want to expand this teaching, not completely replace inner circle teaching, but expand it to include some other things. First, preaching should be expanded to include the faith questions people ask. This is the apologetics that we've spent so much time tonight talking about. As shown earlier, People today do not accept the Bible's teachings. They have been raised to doubt everything we believe. 
They doubt creation. They doubt God's existence. They believe there are other religions as equally as valid as Christianity. They doubt the existence of Jesus. They definitely don't believe in the Bible. And they question suffering, among other things. In order to draw them to the kingdom, then, we must adapt our teaching to include solid, well-reasoned, easy-to-understand answers to those questions. We have to begin to include answers to questions in our preaching and teaching ministries. And it is a mistake only to do this in an event. We cannot simply do it in a one-off or two-off in a year. We have to do more than that, and I'll talk about how to do it in just a moment. But the second way preaching needs to be expanded from the inner circle teaching is to address what I call the issues of the day. The issues of the day. The things that are happening in the world that people are wondering about, that they're looking for answers to or guidance regarding. This becomes a wonderful opportunity to transition that person into the Bible's truth and show them that the Bible has things to say. It's wise, it's sound, it's right, and you should listen to it. You can get people's attention by talking about things that are going on that are issues of the day. Stepping into church on Sunday morning many times is like stepping into another world. We face issues every day, from work to politics to social issues, but we almost never hear about them in any meaningful way on Sunday morning. Most of the time over the course of the years that I've been in the church, I honestly felt like I was living in a completely different world than existed in the minds and in the words and in the issues that were faced when I went to church on Sunday morning. They were almost never addressed in any substantive way. It was like they, we walk into the, to the, to the church and we, we lift ourselves up into this mystical spiritual world where nothing else really is going on. We talk about spiritual subjects, Bible subjects and stuff like that, but it never really connects to and helps people to understand the issues that are going on in the world. The Bible addresses every issue we face. From Black Lives Matter to socialism to marijuana, we cannot continue to act like these don't exist by overlooking them in our preaching. We are missing a great and powerful opportunity to grab the attention of people. Think about if someone walked into our service on Sunday morning. Here's the way we need to be thinking about this, preachers and teachers. We need to make sure that we have at least one concrete, well-reasoned, well thought out, not off the cuff comment or instruction about something going on out in the world. And heaven knows, do we have things to talk about today? Socialism, riots, race, politics, climate, marriage. You don't have to wait long or look very far to find things that you can touch on. And when that person walks in off the street and you're addressing climate, or you're addressing the issue of politics, or socialism, or all these things that the Bible touches on, then you are giving them a reason to come back. You're giving them a pause, and they're not going, well, these Christians are just a bunch of fools. They have no connection to reality. These people live in a dream world, all right? That is what we have to do. So how do you do that? Let me give just three as we end here. Let me give three ideas of ways to adapt preaching. And I want to talk to my preachers and teachers out there, all over, wherever you are. You have to always be growing in your teaching. Times change as the years go by. We need to do different things, talk about different things, and adapt and grow and expand our preaching. We don't want to get into a place where we're just set in our ways. We do the same thing every Sunday, no matter what's going on in the world. We are not being good, the best servants we can be when we do that. So how do we do that? We integrate through, apologet through applications. We integrate through applications. Every sermon has, we're teaching the content of the sermon, we're teaching the content of the, co the context and all that, we're drawing a principle, and then we're making an application. And so one of the things that I've recommended over the years is what I call running a rabbit. 
a question or an issue rabbit. Let's take for example here, in your sermon as you're thinking about applications, let's take this verse here, which, which a lot of preachers I'm sure are talking about this weekend. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now we can take that verse and we can talk about all the inner circle teaching we want to that addresses the Christian, the, the already born again believer who is being discipled in the Lord, and that's great. But how could you also address something, a question or an issue from this verse in your application? Look at this word, God. God. Do you think anybody out there is doubting the existence of God? So when you're going through this verse, one of your applications, you don't have to do it in every one, but one of your application can be, can, applications can be to address the existence of God in some meaningful way. You can say this, this verse addresses the idea of God. Now, a lot of people today don't believe that there is such a thing as God. Well, let me give you one way you can know that there is a God. Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. If Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, only God can do that. No man can do that. Therefore, if He was resurrected, then there must be a God. Think about that this week. And you, you go on. You see that? You're running a rabbit. But it can't be off the cuff. It can't be something you just think of at the moment. Unless you're well-schooled in it and you really know your stuff and you can put together something real sharp, you know, on the spot. So you really have to put some time into this. Well, let's look at this word men. That would be a question rabbit. Now let's look at the word men. What rabbit could we run there? We could run a issue rabbit with the word men. P goodwill toward men. What does that mean? All men. God is showing in the birth of Christ His his desire for him and mankind to have a relationship, to be close to one another. He is extending that to all men. He's extending it to black men, to white men, to red men, to yellow men, whatever you want to, to call it. Every shade of every skin color. And God is made from one blood all nations of the earth. And then we start talking about race. And you can address the issue of Black Lives Matter and violence that they're using to try and promote justice. Or you can address the issue of how politicians stir up race to cause people to divide. But Jesus is trying to unite us through His crucifixion and resurrection. You see what I mean? You run that rabbit. And so here's, here's a lost person sitting there going, hmm, that was really interesting. I never thought about it like that. You can run a rabbit. Now for those of you who aren't preachers and teachers, what does this mean? Why... Let me give you an application here. And that application is that in order to do this and to do it well, preachers need the time to do it. Preachers need the time to do it. We're in that season of the year now where we're also working on the budgets for next year. And one of the things that we have as a goal as the finance team is to eventually be able to support our pastor full time. And one of the reasons that we need to do that is because we need to make sure he has the time to spend working on this stuff. If he's working a full-time job and just barely being able to get his notes together, then he probably does not have the time to really work on this type of detail, the meditation that it takes, and then the additional research to work this out. So when you see the budget and you see the, the team, the finance team, and other people in the church saying, we need to move forward with getting our pastor full-time, that is why he needs that additional time. And when we can give him that time, then the content will be enriched, the, the outcomes will be enriched. That is why we are doing that, because it takes time. And that is what we want to give him, that time to focus on the Word. Everything in the church is driven by the Word. So the amount of time that the pastor has to put into that is going to affect the entire congregation. And we need to be looking forward to building the kingdom through our churches, not keeping them small. There is hardly a church that has a part-time pastor that is really growing. It almost never happens, and this is one of the reasons that it doesn't happen. Integrate through apologetics, applications, I'm sorry I keep saying that word. Do a sermon series topic, so pick four weeks. I recommend two a year, one in the spring and one in the fall on some social or uh, apologetics issue that people are wrestling with. And then finally through events, and we've already talked about that enough. So we need to change the way we think about 
uh, Paul, uh, about uh, evangelism and outreach. We need to see that it, people go through a process to come to faith in Jesus, that it is not just a lightning strike. And then we need to participate in individual efforts and group efforts and preaching efforts in order to reach the lost and to do that hard work that Jesus said so that we will have true conversions and reaping in the future. It may be that my generation will not see that great reaping, but if I, this generation will do the hard work, our children and grandchildren can do that. 